Okay, so welcome everyone to the fourth integrable probability talk for the semester. Um, so just as a heads up, we're meeting at this unusual time on Monday. And also next week, we'll be having another integrable probability talk on Monday as well. Um, so that's just a heads up. And today we'll have uh, Shoshendo Ganguly from Berkeley speaking about stability and chaos and dynamical last passage percolation. So take it away. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation and thanks for showing up. Um, yeah, so, so this is gonna be a talk about a very recent project with Alan Hammond uh, on stability and chaos in a dynamical version of uh, last passage percolation. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll define what the relevant dynamics is and, 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 and also give some um, examples of a study of such dynamical problems in other contexts in statistical mechanics and then maybe get your main result. And, and, and I think we have enough time, so I'll also be able to um, sort of give a broad overview of some of the key, uh, key, key ideas in the groups. And also, I guess uh, I'll be able to track the chat and, and, and feel free to stop me um, during the talk if there are anything that you want clarification on or, or if, I, if you want me to go over something. Okay, good, thanks. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll see what these um, uh, figures mean eventually. Um, uh, okay. So, okay, this is sort of an expert audience. I don't have to go too much into it, but just to sort of make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, so KPZ universality, uh, so I'll do this very quick. So uh, KPZ universality and characteristic exponents. So, so we basically want to understand a, a class of um, random growth and interface models, uh, which have some uh, common properties like uh, slope dependent growth speed. And, and, and there's some global smoothing that typically happens in presence of local roughening forces. And that gives rise to characteristic exponents um, given by this triple one, one third, two third. I'll, 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 I'll refresh uh, your memories if things are maybe slightly hazy at this point. Um, okay, uh, so, but this part will be very quick. Um, so uh, certain exactly solvable models have enabled precise computations um, leading to verification of some of these exponents in, in particular examples. However, many basic probabilistic questions remain um, for which one needs more geometric uh, insight, uh, which along with some of this um, exactly solvable or integrable inputs um, usually um, uh, turn out to be quite useful. So, but, but the basic point is um, you do need some additional uh, arguments of probabilistic or geometric nature to, to treat those questions. Okay, so, so, so let's just dive into the, the model in question. So I'll, I'll talk about last passage percolation. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce two different setups. And um, so let's first look at the discrete version where you have the Z2 lattice. And let's say for every vortex in the lattice, there is some IID random variable. And now you take oriented paths between any two points in the lattice, um, which admit oriented paths within them. And, and, and for each such path, the weight of a path would be simply the sum of the variables along that path. And, and you can, and, and so the actual result will be in a slightly different context, which would be a semi discrete setting uh, where you can think of um, sort of passing to the limit from the discrete portion, where instead you have integer many, uh, like index by integers, um, copies of real line, of the real line. And for, for, uh, for, each, um, for each real line, you have some function. Um, uh, so you have some function, let's say they are pinned at the origin. So every function is zero at zero. Mm, and then given any such oriented path, as in the figure, you sim between two points, you simply add the increments of the functions at the corresponding levels. Okay, I mean, all of this is uh, mostly familiar to everybody, so I don't have to explain too much, but, but yeah, just to sort of broadly set up notation. So you have all these functions um, in, our, in, the, in the example that we will treat uh, these functions would be brown in motions, but, but generally given any function and any such path which stays on the first line for some time, then jumps to the next line, stays there for some time. You basically pick up the increments of the corresponding functions and that's gonna be the weight uh, of the associated oriented path. Okay, so that's the broad setup. So this is the discrete version. This is the sort of semi-discrete version. And um, yeah, so, so we'll work with the semi-discrete model where the noise functions are ID two-sided Brownian motions, which goes by the name of Brownian last passage percolation. And just to set up some notation, um, so we had this situation, right? So you had these lines and suppose you have X i, the point X on the ith line and Y j, um, then, um, then the maximum weight of any path between these two points will be denoted by uh, 
this 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 uh, this notation m x i to y j so pretty uh, self explanatory and and the external paths a path that actually attains um, the maximum um, so for fixed points will be actually unique almost surely but um, we won't worry too much about that in this stuff um, so external paths uh, will be called gd6 um, so that's going to be the setup in which we will state our main results but um, but sort of for the discussion purpose, actually, I'll, whenever I'll describe some key idea, I'll actually sort of work in this uh, discrete setting because it makes it slightly simpler to, to describe stuff there. Okay, so Brownian LPP is where the noise, the independent, the, the functions on each level are, are ID two-sided Brownian motions. And again, you take the increments of any along the path and that's the weight of a path. You look at the maximum weight, that's this notation and the max external path, which attains that maximum weight will be called geodesic. So any questions about the definition of the framework? Okay. And again, so continuing with the notation. So, uh, so in the particular case, when the starting point is zero, zero and the ending point is let's say NN, I'll, I'll denote this, num this slightly uh, cumbersome notation by the shorthand MN. And, and so this is sort of the typical behavior of MN. So MN is roughly like two times N. So if you divide, if you center it by that number, and then it's sort of a fluctuation quantity, the order of fluctuation is actually n to the one third. So you divide by that, and then it converges to the trace evident distribution. So I might have gotten some prefactors wrong here. I'm like, I did not bother about that too much, but it, it's at least up to some constant um, uh, converges to uh, the GUE trace evident distribution, which is a limiting distribution for the largest eigenvalue in a GUE matrix. And this one third here exp explains the uh, one third in the in the in the triple of exponents that I showed in the first slide, um, I, I had something like one one. Sorry, oops, this my slide tends to do this sometimes. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, right. So I had uh, this. So somehow, if the scale of the problem is n, then this is sort of you can think of this as n to the one, which is which is this part. Um, the one third comes from here, and then there's the two thirds that I have just explained. Um, and the two third actually exponent governs um, spatial fluctuations. Uh, so there are various ways to make sense of that. The precise notion that I'll be interested in is the following. Um, the, the exponent two thirds actually describes uh, uh, the transversal fluctuations of the extremal path. So, so suppose uh, you have this picture of scale n, so zero, zero, and NN, and you look at the best path which goes from zero, zero to NN and you see how much it um, fluctuates from, from the straight line joining the end points. And it turns out this is the quantity that scales like uh, N to the two thirds. And um, there are various ways to say this. Uh, one particular way which would, we would come back to later is that this can be described as the location of the maximum or the maximizer of a function like this. So you have a parabola, which is like this x square over n. So because this, this n comes from the scale of the problem. And then let's say you add a Brownian motion to it. So you have this function, which is the Brownian motion plus some parabolic correction. And you want to understand at what x is this quantity of typically maximized. And you can do some basic computation using the fact that this grows like square root of x uh, to try to maximize this quantity. And you will see that this is typically maximized at x, which is like n to the two thirds. Because most of you are already familiar with this, but we will see um, sort of uh, this in more detail later because this will be a crucial aspect of some of the arguments. Okay, so, but broadly the two-thirds exponent describes uh, how much it fluctuates from the straight line joining the two endpoints. Okay, and, and um, so instead of looking at, um, so, so far we were talking about just going from zero, zero to uh, some fixed point and then, but you can also sort of vary the endpoints along, uh, along a straight line like this. And if you scale things properly by this, uh, center it by two n and divide by n to the two thirds uh, uh, and, and divide by n to the one thirds, you can obtain some order one picture, which roughly looks like this. So, so the weight profile um, after suitable scaling sort of converges to a picture like this, where um, the, the law of the sort of, there is a parabolic term, which is given by this, so this x square by n term that appeared in the previous slide sort of uh, becomes x square under proper scaling. And then on top of that, you have some fluctuation term, which is um, locally Brownian, 
but and the law of the and the law of this uh, stationary process is um, and so the stationary process is what is known as uh, the ARE2 process. Uh, again, I might might be missing some multiplicative prefactors. So this is this process has the property that's stationary and it's also locally Brownian, which is why the intuition in the previous slide about maximizer of a parabolic term plus a Brownian motion is indeed uh, what goes on. Okay, so, uh, so, 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 so far we were talking about weights between two fixed points, but now you allow one of the points to vary and then take proper limit, then this is the picture that you expect to get. Okay, so any questions? Okay. Okay, so now let's sort of, having sort of set up this basic uh, framework of last passage percolation, the weights and the, and the weight profile, let's talk about exactly uh, what this um, um, recent work is about. Uh, so chaos and stability. So, so broadly, so I'll, I'll get into LPP uh, soon, but let me suppose sort of introduce this in a sort of slightly broader context. So many disorder statistical mechanics models have intricate energy landscapes, um, in particular last phase percolation and ground state is the state of extremal energy. So you can think of it as the maximum energy or the minimum energy. And so it's not super different if the noise is symmetric. Uh, so and in and so in our case, um, you can think of last passage percolation as a landscape on a space indexed by path. So for every path, there is an associated energy or weight, and the ground state is the path with the largest energy. So so that's how you can put LPP in this sort of broader context. And in many natural models, there are typically many near ground states. So um, so typically, I said that if you fix the endpoints, the ground state is almost surely unique. Uh, but even though the ground state is unique, what would happen typically is that there would be many near ground states. Um, so the uh, so the energy landscape could look something like this. So there would so this might be uh, the sort of smallest energy, but you will have many many sort of values which uh, are almost as good. And, and so what this actually implies is that now, um, so, so there is some underlying noise in all of these models. For example, in Brownian LPP, the, the, the underlying noise was Brownian motion. And then in the discrete version, you have some IID um, random variables that form the underlying noise space. So now if you have all this uh, underlying noise and then you sort of, let's say, port up it a little bit, then it can lead to some profound changes in, in, in how the ground state behaves. So for example, let's say I had this picture initially but now I change my um, noise a little bit. And so it can happen that initially maybe this was the ground state. This was the one which has the smallest energy. But now if you port up things a little bit, maybe this one will become slightly smaller and this one will become slightly bigger, which means the ground state will now sort of move from here to here. And, and, and this is sort of the um, um, phenomenon of chaos where small portobation in, in the underlying noise uh, leads to uh, the ground state to jump from uh, sort of uh, drastically jump from one location to the other. And what will happen is that these ground states will actually be very different from each other. Uh, we'll sort of describe them more precisely, but that's broadly what the picture that you should have in mind. So the, so the landscape is super intricate. There are many, many near ground states and evolving or portaving the noise a little bit makes the ground state shift from one valley to another valley. Uh, okay. And so um, in our discussion, um, and, and also in most of the models that have been studied in the literature, um, the two canonical examples of underlying noise comes from Gaussians or, 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 or Boolean variables. Okay, so, so for example, in Brownian LPP, the underlying measure, underlying noise is Brownian motion, which falls in this Gaussian category, uh, but then there are other models like percolation where, where the Boolean setting is more natural. Okay, so um, any questions about the previous slide? Okay, so okay, so then once you have a noise, then then sort of a natural question is how to portabate. And so there are two natural models of portabation, um, both in the physics literature and in the math literature. So suppose you have a um, Gaussian field sigma, which um, formed your noise space, then there's a natural uh, diffusion that you can run it along, uh, which keeps it stationary and has the property that um, uh, for small times things are really correlated to each other. So more particularly, uh, given a Gaussian field sigma, uh, one can evolve it by along a stationary onshell and unbeck flow. Uh, I'll not define it in a, more, in a very precise sense in this general context, but I'll define it more precisely later. 
so but in for but the important point is that this flow has the property that for any positive time t uh, you have the coupling so let's say sigma t is the gaussian field at time t and sigma was the gaussian field at time zero so you can also call it sigma zero so so there is a coupling where uh, at time t sigma t looks like this so sigma t is e power minus t times the original field sigma plus square root of one minus e power minus two t times an id copy independent id copy of sigma which i denote by sigma prime okay so so that uh, so basically it's a linear combination of two id copies of sigma and the coefficient to the or coefficient in front of the original field is e power minus t which means that for small times t this is very close to one and this is actually very close to root t so you can think of this as a perturbation of the original field sigma. So it turns out that the correlation between sigma t and sigma will be e power minus t. Okay. And uh, so that's sort of a natural model of diffusion in the Gaussian setting. Uh, in the Boolean case, where all the underlying bits are, let's say, Boolean variables, you can simply run a Poisson clock for each of the bits and update each bit at rate one. So, so whenever there is a bit there is a Poisson clock associated to that. And whenever the clock runs, um, you can sort of resample that bit and re uh, replace it by a fresh independent copy. Okay, so, so these are two models of perturbation. Of course, there are other things that one can cook up as well, but given the settings of Gaussian and Boolean, these are rather in some sense canonical, canonical, canonical way to evolve them. Any, any questions about the models of perturbation? Okay. So, so before getting into LPP, let me sort of uh, first uh, um, sort of say a few things about uh, a few uh, sort of um, discuss a few examples of uh, chaos that has already been proven in the literature. So the first thing is very basic. So the energy landscape comes from a quadratic form on the sphere. So here my underlying space is going to be the sphere in n dimension. Let's say I have a matrix H which is a standard GOE matrix of size n. So it's symmetric and all the entries are, are, are standard Gaussians uh, up to symmetry. And I define an energy field on the, on the sphere simply by taking the quadratic form. So energy at point Z on the sphere is Z transpose HZ, uh, where H is this random matrix. So of course the ground state um, the Z that maximizes or minimizes this uh, corresponding to I'm like how you define bound state, but I'm like everything is symmetric here. So let's just work with maximizing it. Um, so ground state is gonna be the largest eigenvector because the largest eigenvector V1 is the one that actually maximizes this quadratic form. And so, um, so what Chatterjee showed in 2009 was the chaotic nature of the leading eigenvector. So you have this, um, random matrix whose entries are IID Gaussians. Um, so what you can do is you can evolve all, all the, so here is your matrix. This is symmetric. So let's just look at the uh, upper diagonal part. So each of these entries are IID Gaussians. So each of them actually flow along an uh, independent OU process, which keeps uh, independent one dimensional Orson-Nurnbeck process, which keeps the standard Gaussian invariant. So for each time slice, you get a copy of this GOE matrix, but of course they're correlated in time, a lot, uh, as I sort of discussed in the previous slide, the correlation between time zero and time t is e power minus t. So you can look at the leading eigenvector at time zero, let's call that v0. Look at the leading eigenvector at time t, that's vt. So what Chatterjee showed in 2009 uh, was uh, that the inner product between v0 and vt, um, so these are both unit vectors, they're both elements of the sphere. Uh, so the inner product actually goes to zero as soon as t is uh, growing bigger than n to the minus one third. Okay, so you have this ground state at time zero, ground state at time t, um, and what this basically says is that they're roughly completely different because they're both, they're roughly orthogonal to each other. So the eigenvector jumps from one direction to a completely orthogonal direction as soon as this noise is evolved up to time, which is uh, growing bigger than n to the minus one third, where n was the size of the matrix. <clears throat> um, any questions about the statement? Okay, and then subsequently, um, this was improved greatly um, by Bordenave, Lugosi, and Zhivodovsky, um, uh, who proved a universality result, which showed that um, this sort of phenomenon holds for any Wigner matrix. 
um, under, some, under some nice assumptions. And moreover, uh, they also showed the other direction, which is they also treated the case when T was much, much smaller than n to the minus one third, which was absent from Chatterjee's work. So what they showed was if T is much, much smaller than n to the minus one third, these things are highly correlated, it means that this inner product is actually pretty close to one. And, and, it, and it goes to zero as long as, as soon as T is growing faster than this. So this really sort of establishes a sort of phase transition in, in the behavior of the eigenvector for, for Wigner matrices under this natural evolution. Uh, any questions? Okay, and so, and so one of the key things that they used here was um, sort of resolvent analysis that are uh, sort of powerful tools that you can use in random matrix theory. And, and so one of the challenges in understanding similar question and answering similar questions in LPP is that such, such tools that are prevalent in random matrices uh, are not quite available in the, uh, in the last passage population setting. But anyhow, so that's one, one of the first examples of uh, rigorously proving a chaotic behavior of an, of a, for an observable of interest in, in, in an energy landscape. Okay. Uh, so another sort of very popular model where, where people have studied uh, chaotic behavior are, are models of spin glasses. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go over that. So, so Sherrington, Kirkpatrick, and more generally mixed piece spin glass models have all, also been sort of analyzed greatly to understand their chaotic behavior. Uh, so sort of very, very quickly, the, the most basic model, the SK model, is you, you have your, um, the underlying space is the hypercube now instead of the sphere of n dimensions. You have ID Gaussians, again, like the, um, like, like the previous slide, where you, again, you have a random matrix whose entries are ID Gaussians. And now you look at, again, the quadratic form, but of course, now you're just restricting on the hypercube and not on the full sphere. Okay, so that's basically the Hamiltonian, which, which governs a spin glass measure on the hypercube. And again, X star, uh, which, is, uh, which is the one that minimizes, uh, the maximizes this quadratic form will be called the ground state. And again, one can ask similar questions. If you now port up these Gaussians, how does the how does the ground state move around? And um, so again, in the same paper, um, Chatterjee in 2009 um, considered a positive temperature version of that, where instead of just looking at the ground state, he looked at the measure on the hypercube given by e power beta times this Hamiltonian, which was a quadratic form, and showed that R x y is the overlap between x and y. So showed that if you take two samples. Um, so you, you look at the original Gibbs measure given by this ID Gaussians. Now you port up the Gaussians and get a new Gibbs measure. And what is showed that if you take X and Y to be two samples from these two Gibbs measures, one of them, the original one and the other one, the port up one, then their overlap is small whenever beta is positive and, and, you port, and their perturbation is uh, of constant strength. Okay. I, I, I'm not quite being very precise here about the quantifiers, but broadly the spirit is that um, instead of looking at the ground state, he was looking at a random sample from this Gibbs measure and a, and a port of version of that and, and, and showed that again, you have some chaotic behavior. So which means that the measures are roughly supported on different parts of the space as soon as you uh, port up the order a little bit. And subsequently, there have been many improvements. Uh, one, a couple of them, which I want to mention. So, so there was a paper by Jean Ding, Ronan Eldon, and Alex Jai, um, who, who proved uh, an improved estimate on the number of uh, near peaks in the, in the spin glass landscape. And then very refined estimates were obtained by Wei Ko Chen later. Um, and then subsequently, ground, the ground state, which uh, was not quite analyzed in Chatterjee's work, was also shown to be chaotic in this paper of uh, Chen Hanschke and Lermer for even P models, so for a subclass of the spin glass models, and, and then completely generally by Eldon very recently. So again, um, as the eigenvector situation, which was a quadratic form on the sphere, if you now restrict it on the hypercube, you get a similar behavior where, um, where the ground state sort of keeps jumping around as you port up the noise. Um, okay. And the la last example, um, which is sort of, I guess, the most famous example in this sort of world, um, comes from critical percolation. So, what is the model? So, so you can you can talk about percolation on any lattice, but for the moment, uh, let me just focus on the hexagonal lattice. So, in this picture, um, all the faces are hexagons. So, this is sort of you can think of this as a dual to the triangle lattice, and each 
hexagon is open or closed with probability one half independently. And let's say I want to understand uh, the observable, uh, whether there is a crossing of open hexagons from the left to the right. Okay, so, so, that's, um, so let's say this is the random variable that I care about, indicated that there is a left to right open crossing in this, uh, in this noise field. Of course, everything is Boolean here. And, and dynamical percolation, uh, which was introduced by um, uh, several people, I think simultaneously, one particular uh, group being uh, Paras Benjaminian Stife, I think. Um, uh, so where every, the state of every uh, hexagon, which whether it's open or closed, gets again updated at rate one. So again, we are in this Boolean setting where this sort of makes sense. And then XT is this random variable of open left to right open crossing at time t. And, and the question of interest is how does the correlation between x0, the status of this crossing event at time zero, and the status of this crossing event at time t decay as a function of t. So you would expect as time goes on, uh, things are becoming more and more independent because you're updating more and more bits. So you want to really understand the, the exponents that govern the decay of correlation for such objects. And this was actually really uh, settled in two sort of uh, um, sort of this was initiated in this sort of breakthrough paper of Benjamin Kalai Shram, which really introduced a Poe analysis for Boolean functions to study such problems. And then subsequently, this this actual question, like this was a very general paper which also studied different um, other uh, random variables. And then this paper of um, Garbon, Pete, and Shram really pinned this behavior of this down by really sort of uh, using very refined information about um, uh, about uh, critical percolation on the hexagonal lattice coming from theory of SLEs and, and, and related stuff. So, so it's actually now completely understood what the behavior of this is as a function of time. Okay, so, so these are some of the examples that we, I wanted to sort of highlight. So eigenvectors, spin glasses and critical percolation. And so, so what the current, the recent work that we did with Alan was about is to sort of see what exactly the analogous theory is in this KPC world. Um, so, so the main results, so I'll now state the main result and then, um, and then sort of go into some of the ideas. So, so the goal is to understand chaos for Brownian last passage percolation. Okay, so what do you have? So you initially have a bunch of uh, two-sided Brownian motion. So let's call them B0 which is B01 is let's say the Brownian motion at level one at time zero, B02, blah, blah, blah. And then um, there is a way to evolve this according to an OU process, uh, which keeps Brownian motion invariant. Uh, and so at any time T, I get again, a family of Brownian motions, B1, T, B2, T, blah, blah, blah. And I call this entire ensemble as script BT. Okay, so, so for every time T, I have a, for any, so I have a, I have a joint, Gaussian process, so any time slice looks like a set of independent two-sided Brownian motions. Okay, so that's gonna be my underlying dynamical noise model. And then um, let me um, sort of set up some notation. So let's call gamma 00 nn and gamma t 00 nn to be the geodesics at time zero and at time t between 00 and nn. Okay, so uh, for every time I have some underlying Brownian LPP model, I can look at uh, the geodesic uh, at different times and, and those are the ones that I call gamma. So I could have also maybe called this gamma zero that might have been slightly more consistent. Anyhow, so I look at the geodesic between 2.00 and then at two different times and let me define O and T to be the fractional overlap between the paths. So recall that both the paths look like this, right? So, so you go from zero, zero to NN. So, um, one of the paths maybe look like looks like this. So, so this is zero zero. This is an n. But so this is maybe a time zero at time t. It, the path could look like this. So so these are both. Uh, you can think of these as both uni so union of a bunch of one-dimensional segments. So you can look at their intersection. So they, those will also be union of some intervals. You can look at the Lebesgue measure. That's a real number. And you can convince yourself that the Lebesgue measure is at most n because the total Lebesgue measure of this path, because everything is going from zero, zero to n, n, uh, the total Lebesgue measure of any, that any path sort of covers is n. So their overlap can have at most Lebesgue measure n. So it makes sense to divide everything by n. So, so O n t is gonna be the fractional overlap between these two paths. 
meaning you take the Lebesgue measure of the intersection and then divide by n. So that's a unit order quantity. And again, recall that mn0 and mnt are the weights of the geodesics at time zero and t. Okay, so that's a basic notation that I want to set up. Uh, and okay. And so what are the questions of interest? So the questions of interest, if you think about the critical percolation question is to understand the, how the correlation sort of behaves, the correlation between the weight at time zero and weight at time t. Or if you think about the eigenvector question or the spin glass question, it's a more geometric uh, question where you can understand how does the overlap between the two paths behave as a function of t. So these are the two broad questions that one might want to answer. Any questions about the framework? Okay. And so, um, so the main theorem uh, with Hammond is the following. So um, it says that there exists a positive uh, uh, constant D and some and not so I mean the quantifiers are not extremely important uh, such that for any time T um, between zero and n to the minus one third times some exponential of uh, poly log log n terms. So, so if you run your evolution for any time T which is smaller than n to the minus one third in a precise sense. So T is less than n to the minus one third times some exponential of poly log log n correction then the overlap between the geodesic at time zero and the geodesic at time t is at least some constant with very high probability. So which means that the two geodesics overlap significantly as long as the disorder is not caught up too much in the sense that the time that you have evolved it for is strictly smaller than n to the minus one third in a reasonably precise sense. So you see that this n to the minus one third is also the exponent that showed up in the eigenvector uh, sort of situation. So, so this result shows that you have constant overlap when t is much, much smaller than n to the minus one third. And this is the situation that we will refer to as a subcritical case. Okay, so in the subcritical regime, meaning t is much, much less than n to the minus one third, much, much less in this precise sense, um, the overlap is macroscopic with very high probability. Okay. And conversely, if t is uh, bigger than n to the minus one third, I mean, it, uh, you don't have to worry too much about the upper bound. Uh, that's not very important. Um, the overlap uh, between uh, the geodesic at time zero and the geodesic at time t, O and t, um, is smaller than tau to the minus one half with high probability. What is tau? Tau is exactly the scaled object. So t is bigger than n to the minus one third. So, so it makes sense to scale everything by n to the one third to get order one quantities. So let's call tau as n to the one third times t. So when t is literally n to the minus one third, tau is one. As t becomes larger and larger, tau blows up. And what this says that as tau blows up, meaning t becomes larger, the overlap is smaller than one by root tau with high probability. Okay, so this shows that if you're subcritical, the two results go well together show that if you're subcritical, then you have macroscopic overlap. If you're supercritical, as time increases, the overlap decreases with high probability. Overlap is small with high probability. And um, so basically, which means that in the supercritical region, the, the geodesics are almost disjoint. And this uh, upper bound uh, of one is not very important. Actually, uh, whatever bound you get by plugging in t equal to one in this expression will continue to hold for t bigger than equal to one as well. Okay, so are the statements clear? Okay, so, so just to summarize in super, subcritical, the n to the minus one third is the key number. So if it's smaller than that, then you have constant overlap. If you're bigger than that, you are almost disjoint. Okay, um, so let me first quickly, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe various approaches and some of them will be just simply heuristics and then eventually I'll tell you what is exactly the math that we do, but at least to uh, sort of guide some intuition, I'll, I'll describe various approaches to, towards seeing why n to the minus one third is the critical, uh, critical value that you might expect. Um, okay. So how much time, uh, so, um, okay, so, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll describe the, so it might be a good, uh, so I'll, I'll describe the heuristics and then it might be a good stopping time and then we can come back and discuss the more rigorous stuff later. Okay, so, so we'll see how that goes. 
Okay, so recall that the weight, uh, so, okay, so now I'll spend some time on understanding why, uh, trying, to, trying to sort of convey why this is sort of the critical value. Okay, so recall that Mn, the geodesic weight between zero, zero and Nn at any fixed time behaves like two N plus order N to the one third, right? That was the KPZ fluctuation. And so to discuss the heuristics, it would be cleaner to sort of talk about discrete models where each beat is, let's say, updated at weight one. Uh, uh, I'll throw out sort of the heuristic section. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll only sort of refer to discrete models. So let's say, for example, XIJs are um, are now ID Gaussians, or you can think of them as ID uh, Bernoulli's. It doesn't matter too much. And let's say you're updating every um, bit at rate one. So let's say this was your geodesic at time zero. Now you're updating things. So let's say some of the bits on the geodesic get updated. Okay, so let's say so, so the claim is that the overlap continues to hold for t much, much less than n to the minus one third. But let's look at a smaller time. Let's look at force t much, much smaller than n to the minus two thirds first. Okay. So by this time, the number of bits that get updated on the path, it's on the geodesic itself, is much, much smaller than n to the one, one third, right? Because the path has length n. The path has length n. So if you only have this much amount of time, in this much amount of time, the number of bits that on the path that will get touched will be roughly n times the time. And, and the time, because it's much more smaller than n to the minus two thirds, you see that the number of bits is much more smaller than n to the one third. So what this means is that the value of this path will change only by little o of n to the one, one third, but uh, whenever t is much, much smaller than n to the minus two thirds. So this is a much smaller time. So we are really interested at scale, which is n to the minus one third, but for the moment, let's just look at a smaller time. And by this set of logic, the number of bits that get refreshed um, is only little of n to the one third. And which means that the amount that the weight of the path changes by is smaller than is smaller than n to the one third, which is the characteristic fluctuation of the path. So, so from there, one can argue that um, this path of course, you cannot expect it to be exactly the geodesic at this time because there will be some microscopic changes, but at least this path globally would continue to be a near geodesic because the amount, it was a geodesic at time zero and, and the perturbation that has happened is only affecting the fluctuation by a tiny bit, much smaller than the scale of the problem. The actual fluctuation of the path itself is n to the one third. So this thing can be thought of as a smaller order term. So, so the path which is geodesic at time zero at time t continues to be a near geodesic. And, and so somehow one can then from there sort of maybe expect that the actual geodesic should be very close and in particular overlap significantly. Um, however, um, so we claim that the overlap continues to hold for a much larger time. So it, the overlap continues to hold for T up to N to the minus one third, which is much longer than N to the minus two thirds. Okay. So notice that as T becomes larger and, and approaches N to the minus one third, the weight of the geodesic now falls by a large, much larger quantity. It falls by n to the two thirds because the number of bits that get changed on the path uh, will actually be of size n to the two thirds. And, and to begin with, all the variables in the geodesic are slightly stochastically higher than a typical environment because the geodesic passes through high values roughly. So when you refresh them, you're typically making them smaller than they previously were. So they will all create some negative drift and the number of variables that get changed will be of size this, which is very large. And so at this point, this path itself will be hopelessly incompetitive. Like, so the weight is too small compared to the fluctuation, uh, what the typical fluctuation of the problem allows. However, what will typically happen is that you, you update some bit here. Uh, so that value will change, but what the geodesic will do is it will actually locally reroute to sort of find the locally sort of best path to get around this problematic bit that you updated. So whenever there will be some update, the uh, of course this is all heuristic, but but this will sort of explain in some sense why n to the minus one third is sort of the correct scale. Uh, so so you have this local reroutings uh, to sort of make up for the loss that you sort of incur when you simply update this bit. However, one can sort of, uh, it's not very uh, implausible that because the local reroutings happen at different parts of the space, their effects are roughly independent. So whenever you have some bit that gets updated, you locally reroute. 
the path locally redoubts to get around that. But the effects are roughly independent, leading to a central limit theorem type effect. So you have updated n to the two thirds many bits by this time. All of them have some effect, but the effects are roughly independent and you sum them up, but in, then you get a CLT effect. And the CLT effect tells you that the net effect that you see, if you have this many bits that get updated is actually a square root of that number. And which is n to the one third, which exactly matches the order of fluctuation of the problem. So, so when T was very small, the number of bits updated was already small enough. And so nothing had to change too much because the total amount of change incurred by the geodesic at time zero was already small enough. However, as T becomes larger and larger, the number of bits that get updated becomes larger. The geodesic becomes uh, very bad because you keep losing all these uh, amounts at all the places that you update. But there are nearby uh, sort of fertile regions where the geodesic will reroute through, but they will happen in different parts of the space. So, and so their effects will be sort of all independent leading to a central limit theorem type of effect, uh, which, which means that the eventual difference in the weight between the geodesic at time zero and geodesic at time t would roughly be square root of the number of bits that get updated, um, which is um, n to the one third, as long as the number of bits get, which get updated is at most n to the two thirds. And because this matches exactly the fluctuation behavior of the geodesic weight to begin with, you can expect that this is really where the transition is expected to happen. Okay, so this explains at least in a very, very heuristic sense um, uh, why n to the minus one third might be the right threshold. So, so this explains roughly why this roughly is the right threshold. Any, any questions about the heuristics? So this is all very like, this is nothing is formal here at this point. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's make it slightly more formal and we will actually um, sort of borrow some of the Fourier analysis that went into understanding particle percolation. So I'll spend some time setting up the Fourier analysis. Actually the proof that we have for Brown and LPP also uses Fourier analysis but in Gaussian space, but it's slightly cleaner to describe things in the Bernoulli setting, which is what I will do. So now pretend that you have Bernoulli LPP. So here is your lattice. Uh, you can either think of every vortex as plus one, minus one, or zero, one. So it's actually slightly cleaner to assume that things are minus one and one instead of zero and one. Okay, so, so given such a, um, so which basically means the, so if the box size was capital N, the, and then little n is capital N square. Then you can think of the last passage per problem with this, uh, with Boolean noise as a function from the hypercube of dimension little n, which is size of the box square to the real numbers, right? So, so, so I'll set things up more generally, but you can put the last passage problem in this setting if things are Bernoulli, uh, let's say Bernoulli one half. Okay, so, so I have, uh, let's say I have some function from the hypercube uh, of dimension n to the real line. Uh, so you can think of this as, you can of course equip this with a natural probability measure, which is the uniform measure on the hypercube. And now I can look at its uh, L2 space and, and look at its Fourier basis. So it turns out that the Fourier basis has a very nice exp expression in the Boolean case so they are simply indexed by subsets of one through n. So n is the size of your, n is the dimension of your space. So take any subset S of one through n and, uh, so, and look at the function which evaluated at point x. So x is an element in the hypercube. I'm oh, sorry. So for any x in the hypercube, look at the function chi of S so indexed by the subset S, evaluated the X to be simply the product of the bits XI corresponding to the bits inside S, right? So each vector X is a vector of size N of, of size of minus one and ones. You take some subset of bits, a subset of coordinates S between one to N and simply multiply all the bits corresponding to those coordinates. And that's a valid function. And for the empty set, when S is empty, you simply define chi of phi or the empty set to be one, okay? So many of you might have already seen this before. So these actually form an orthogonal basis uh, for the L2 space uh, associated to the uniform measure on the hypercube, okay? 
Uh, so you can you can sort of do sort of um, um, you can expand it. so which means that you can for any function f there's a natural expansion uh, in terms of the Fourier basis so let's call that as uh, um, let's call the coefficient of the uh, s uh, eigen function corresponding to the set s as alpha s so because the empty set uh, for the empty set chi s was one uh, the the coefficient of the the, co the corresponding coefficient alpha of phi is simply the expectation of f. So actually, this is a typo. So I mean, uh, I, I don't mean this. Uh, sorry, bad color. Okay, so the so the zeroth coefficient is the expectation, and then you have some non-trivialities happening for the other eigenfunctions. And of course, as uh, is sort of done in algebra theory, so the coefficient alpha s is simply the inner product between f and the corresponding Fourier basis basis element. Okay, so, so now you have, um, we'll see why these things are useful. So by Parseval's theorem, the variance of f is simply the summation of the coefficient square uh, for the sets that are non-empty. Okay, so that's simply, uh, so saying that this is an L2 isometry. Okay, and so now actually it turns out that there is a key object that uh, needs to be defined, which is a spectral sample. So spectral sample is actually a random subset of the coordinates. So, so this is what I denote by script S. So the probability, so this is a different probability measure, Q. So Q of a Q, the prob probability under Q that the spectral sample is a given set S is simply the SF coefficient alpha square normalized. Okay, so I, I know by Percival this variance is the summation of this coefficient square. I normalized by variance of F to get one on the left-hand side and that gives me a sum of positive numbers that is a probability measure. And then for each number, there's a nationally associated subset of coordinates S. And so I basically put a random measure on subsets of, uh, I basically put a measure on subsets of the uh, subsets of one through N uh, with this probability distribution that the given the, the random set S, script S is equal to a particular set S with probability alpha squared by variance of F. So any, any questions about the definition? Okay, and so, okay, why is this important? It turns out uh, that the spectral sample comes up naturally in understanding correlation when you evolve things according to time. So you look at the function at time zero. So again, you have this Boolean hypercube. You can, you have a function on that. Now you can update each bit at rate one. So you get some element of the hypercube at time t. You can evaluate the function at time zero and at, at time t, and you can understand how you can try to ask what is the behavior of the correlation between time zero, the function at time zero and function at time t? It turns out it's simply the expectation under this measure on subsets of e power minus t, t is the time that you have evolved the uh, noise by, times the size of the spectral sample. So the correlation is directly encoded by um, the expectation of exponential of the spectral sample. Um, which you can, if you can use Jensen, so you can use Jensen here, which is simply bigger equal to e power minus t expected size of the spectral sample. Okay. So what does this roughly mean? It roughly means that the function is noise sensitive means that small t will make correlation very close to zero. If most of the spectral sample, uh, most of the mass of the spectral sample is actually concentrated on sets which have large size which is actually basically saying, if you look at the Fourier expansion of F, most of the L2 mass is actually concentrated on the higher frequency modes. Because you see that the higher frequency modes are exactly the ones that correspond to larger S. So larger the typical value of the spectral sample is, the faster the decay of correlation is. Okay, so um, any, any questions about this? Uh, this uh, proving this is actually an easy exercise in sort of simple Fourier analysis in, in, in the Boolean setting. Okay, so it turns out that there is also a very nice expression for, um, for, uh, for the expected size of the spectral sample. I'm like, it's actually a very hard thing to exactly understand the distribution of this random set. But if you just want to simply compare, compute its expectation of the size, then actually it turns out that there is a very nice formula. And this was um, already there in Benjamin Nicolai Schramm, which we also sort of, sort of use. So the expected size of the spectral sample is basically the sum of the influences by variance. So what do I mean by influence? So you take your function f, x is a random element of the hypercube. Every coordinate is plus minus one with probability one half independently. 
And let's say for any vertex v between one to n, you simply update the value of v. Like you, you take a you take your vector x. Here is x v. And you simply replace it by a new uh, updated independent copy of x prime v. And the new vector that you get, let's call that x v. So you get from x x v by simply updating the bit corresponding to coordinate v. And you look how much the value of the function changes. So fx minus fx v, and look at the square. Actually, the square is inside. Um, so basically, this measures how much influence the particular vertex v has on your function, how much altering that value changes the global function. And now you sum over all v, and you divide by the variance of f. So that's exactly going to be uh, uh, the expected size of the spectral sample. Okay, so it's a reasonably nice formula. And let's see what um, this might be in our context. So we want to understand the spectral sample in our context, expected spectral sample. So you want to understand how, so an F is of course the weight of the geodesic, right? So in our case, F is the maximum weight of any path going between zero, zero and n, n, let's say. So suppose the red guy is your geodesic and suppose V is somewhere here and you update it it will typically not change the value of the geodesic at all because typically any path that uses V will be much, much smaller uh, compared to the value of the geodesic. So it, it's actually, I'm mean, like, of course, all of this is Boolean, so not much is known, but heuristically, um, it is sort of not hard to convince yourself that this quantity is uh, non-zero typically only when uh, V is very close to the geodesic. So, or, or either on the geodesic. So, so, so you can sort of basically say that this sum is restricted to, at least for the heuristic purpose, you can sort of assume that uh, this sum is restricted to only the V, which is on the geodesic, roughly. Okay, so the geodesic has length N. So which means that the sum is of order N. The top sum is of order N, because I'm basically ignoring all the other V, which is away from the geodesic. The variance of F we expect, of course, in Bernoulli, nothing is known, but we expect variance of f to be n to the two thirds. So you see that the spectral, expected spectral sample size is n over n to the two thirds, which is n to the one third. So the spectral sample has expectation n to the one third, which now you can use uh, to understand how the correlation decays. So, um, so the correlation of fx0 and fxt, we saw that it decayed like exponential of e power minus t times the spectral sample size, which is bigger than by Jensen e power minus t expectation of the spectral sample. And we know that the spectral sample is of size n to the one third, which is exactly what we just computed in the previous slide, which means if t is much more smaller than n to the minus one third, this whole thing is very, very close to one. So it means that the correlation between the geodesic weight at time zero and the geodesic weight at time t is very, very close to one if t is much more smaller than n to the minus one third. Okay, so that's another way to at least some, from some Fourier analysis see uh, why you would expect uh, n to the minus one third to be the right threshold. But again, like I said, so all of this was simply heuristics because one does not have sharp variance estimates for Bernoulli LPP, nor does one know any nice things about the geodesic behavior. So, but this is sort of to motivate how maybe one can use uh, uh, Fourier analysis to also come up to come, uh, come to the same conclusion that n to the minus one third is the right threshold. Okay, so now I think the remaining thing I wanted to do is actually to say what exactly we do in the formal proof. Um, uh, so I think I'm already slightly uh, running behind, but so we have around 30 more minutes, right? Um, yep. Uh, so I'm like, if people want to take a break, maybe we can take a quick five minute break and then we can come back to this. Uh, yep, sounds good. So, uh, okay, so we'll pause for now and then continue in five minutes. Yeah, maybe, 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 yeah, in five minutes, yes. Mm -hmm.